The EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network presents Theology of the Body with your hosts, Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno. Hello again. My name is Father Richard Hogan. I'm a priest of the Archdiocese of St. Paul, Minneapolis, in Minnesota. And I, with the permission of our Archbishop there, work full-time with a national apostolate called Natural Family Planning Outreach of the Archdiocese of Oklahoma City. Welcome back to this third show on this exciting discussion of John Paul II's Theology of the Body. I'm Katrina Zeno, and I'm co-foundress of Women of the Third Millennium. And I'm excited for this show because we've hit one of my favorite topics, which is the body, and how, as human persons, we're made in the image and likeness of God through bo being both body and spirit, yeah. which is why it's called Theology of the Body. Right, right. It's interesting, you know, Katrina, that um, many, many people, when you ask them, are there any other persons in the universe besides mm -hmm. human persons, they look at you kind of funny. And I always say I'm not talking about little green men on Mars or something, people we don't know of yet or we're going to discover, but are there any other known persons in the universe? I don't know, have you had that experience? Well, actually, I stopped a philosophy professor at Franciscan University one time and asked him a very similar question. I said, Dr. Crosby, are angels persons because I'm assuming that's what you're referring to right, yeah. because I didn't know that was a hole in my catechesis and he said yes because because angels are persons <laughs> and they have minds and wills which is the definition of person I, I'm glad Dr. Crosby said that I know him and so I'm glad he agrees with me mm -hmm. but angels are persons because they have minds and wills personhood is defined as the ability to think and choose or having the powers of thinking and choosing having a mind and a will so the angels are persons. Mm -hmm. And then I usually ask, are there any other persons in the universe? And they sort of scratch their heads. But God, God the three well. persons That's of the Trinity. Right. Everybody knows that, Father, mm -hmm. Son, and Holy Spirit. And as God, in the divine nature, people don't attend to this. Uh, God doesn't have a body, not, yeah. in, not in his divinity, not in the divine nature. Mm -hmm. So there are the three persons in God, and there are the angels, and then there are us. And if you ask them, well, are there any other living body beings in the world? Well, then you get, you know, obviously the answer of the animals. Right. And every now and then somebody will say, well, I guess the plants are body living beings. And they are. They're, we don't think of them that way, but, but they really are. So we're rather strange, don't you think? We are, because the other human persons, I'm sorry, the other persons that God has um, created are the angels. And then, of course, himself, you know, uncreated God. And so to think that there are actually three types of persons in the universe, divine persons, angelic persons, and then human persons. And as we said before, that as human persons, we're the only creature that images God by being both body and body spirit. And, and that's why we're so different, because yeah. we have bodies. And John Paul, in a certain sense, asks himself in the Theology of the Body series, as you know, why did God make us? Mm -hmm. what, what's the point? What do we bring to the party, so to speak, if he wanted more uh, persons in the universe, there's any number of angels he might have created. After all, he's an infinite, all-merciful mm -hmm. God. He could do anything he wanted. And if he wanted more living body beings in the world, or any number of species of animals he could have created. I always quote George Lucas. I mean, if George can come up with all these exotic creatures in Star Wars and all the rest of his movies, I mean, I'm sure God could have right. if he had wanted to. So the question then is, well, why did God make us? And you usually get, well, because uh, he loved us. Well, of course, but he loved the angels, too. That isn't an answer as to why he created us. But there's a unique way that we image him, isn't there? Right, and that's obviously what John Paul II says. The reason God created us, it goes to our uniqueness. And our mm -hmm. uniqueness among the world of persons is that we have bodies. Mm -hmm. And our uniqueness among the world of body beings is that we're persons. We're the only beings in the universe that can manifest or express make known personhood hmm. in the world, in the visible world, because the other persons don't have bodies, right. the three persons in God and the angelic persons, and the other living bodies in the world, the animals and plants, are not persons. I think that's an important distinction because I know some people want to lump human beings and animals together as if they were equal. Oh, yes, And yes, this really, yeah. you know, Genesis, I find it fascinating that in Genesis, only human persons are defined based on their relationship with God. 
Right. The, the right. animals aren't based on no. being they're on being made in the image and likeness of God. That's not how they're defined. And yet, as human persons, we're defined based, based on our relationship with God, imaging Him. And there's another important point there on the sixth day, when God rests mm -hmm. from the sixth day, He says, and it was very good. But when he rests on all the other five days of creation, he says only that it's good. Mm -hmm. Now, that wasn't just a slip of the pen on the part of the author. That was the inspired text of God. And it's much different, the sixth day, because the last being God created on the sixth day were human persons. Mm -hmm. And that is what was very good about the sixth day. The Pope talks about the human body as speaking a language, mm -hmm. the language of the body or the language of personhood. Now, of course, everybody knows this, especially in our country. We've been talking about body language for, for uh, I don't know, a couple of decades yes, anyway. Yes, exactly. If I slump down yeah, like right. this, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. that means one thing as yeah. opposed to if I'm up like this, very eager. Our body does speak a language. language. There was a survey done, I don't know how long ago, about the number of words that men and women use. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that on the average, men are blessed only with 10,000 words per day. But women are blessed with 25,000. So you know when he comes home from work, maybe she's been at work, maybe she's at home, and she asks, how is, was your day, honey? The answer is? Fine. Fine. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> One word. <laughs> One word. He doesn't say anything the rest of the day. The rest of the evening, that's because he's used up all his words. Yeah. And she's still got 15,000 or right. so. Right. And she, she wants to say, well, I went to the grocery yeah. store, and there I saw <laughs> Helen, and then I dropped the kids off. But do you know who? Right. She goes on and right. on. But if she doesn't read body language, she'll never know what he's thinking. Right. And it's especially true with the young children. It's especially true with people who are uh, emotionally troubled. You know, you ask a, a family member what's wrong. Nothing. Nothing. Well, and you know very well right. that something's right. wrong. But the Pope is talking about a little bit different body language, isn't well, he? Well, yes, but it goes deeper than just that. He's mm -hmm. talking about, as you know, that the body is the expression of the person. Mm. But when we act like God... When we do what we're called to do, because as human beings, we're called by our very being, that is to say that we're in, in the image and likeness of God, to act like Him. Mm -hmm. And if we act like Him, act like God, and express those acts out, outwardly, the body becomes a physical image of God Himself. That's amazing. I mean, really, that amazes me when I wake up in the morning to think that this day I image God, that my body reveals God. And, you know, when I talk about theology of the body, you know, I always ask people, well, what does theology of the body mean? And they kind of say, um, um, because we throw the term around, but often... Now we do. We, we didn't right. 30 years You're ago. Right. We didn't even five years ago. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, theology is the study of God. Right. Um, but I always like to say, you know, I don't think you've ever gone up to heaven and right. studied God directly. Right. I haven't either. And so theology is really the study of how God reveals himself. Right. And body means the human body. Right. So theology of the body means God reveals himself through the human through body. The body. Right. Or that's still kind of long. So I always just like to say the body reveals God. God. When we act like God. Right. Now, exactly. Now, when we're sinning, it's a different matter. Yeah. But, but when we act like God, and most of our acts are expressed outwardly in and through the body because that's the kind of beings we are. Mm -hmm then the body does reveal God, just as you said. It does yeah. reveal God, but as you said, it also reveals myself. You can't know what I'm thinking or acting or feeling, except that I express it through my body. So the body reveals God, and the Pope also says the body expresses the person. Right. So how right. I, um, what I want to convey, I have to convey through my body. I can't just convey it telepathy through right. my mind. Right, right, exactly. And the thing is that this confers on the body this incredible dignity. Mm. I mean, think of this flesh and blood that we don't always treat the best, mm -hmm. that we don't always like the best. Usually most of us have something or other that we'd like to change about ourselves. But God likes us just the way we are because we reveal God. We reveal Him. We speak the language of the Trinity, the language of God Himself in and through this flesh and blood. And if you actually start to live this out, I mean, consciously think about it, it sounds like you do that every morning, then you will change mm. the way you look at yourself, but especially the way you look at other people. You know, even uh, people who cut in front of you on the freeway <laughs> or irritate you in other ways driving, they're still images of God. Their bodies are uh, capable of expressing God, even if at that one particular moment they may not be. So it really means that the body is sacred. It's sacred it? and it's holy. It's not just something I lug around with me. It's not something where I just can't wait till I get rid of it. It's really integral. It's integral to who exactly. I am 
and more than that, it's sacred, so it needs to be treated in a sacred way. And yet in our culture, I think you've experienced, and I have too, more often people treat the body like an object. Do you find that? Oh, yes, and it's, it's most often uh, considered to be really just a thing or a machine, mm -hmm. uh, something we own and operate. It's very, very common. Uh, for example, if you look at the, at the movies, the whole uh, Star Wars, RoboCop, all the science fiction movies portray the body almost as though it's a machine. And you take, for example, the RoboCop series, that's where a policeman becomes a computer with all this armor and he can do everything. It's sort of a Superman story, but the way the superpowers accrue to this person is because he becomes a machine. Mm. Not in his dignity as a human person. No, it's, no. It's what he can accomplish, accomplish as a machine now. That mm -hmm. he couldn't do before. And, of course, then you have uh, machines who are persons. So there was a, a RoboCop as a person who becomes a machine. You have <laughs> machines who are portrayed as persons, like Data on Star mm -hmm. Trek. I don't know, are you a Star Trek fan? No, I'm sorry. No, you, you must know who Data is. You couldn't live in the United States today without knowing that. Well, but. tell me. Refresh my memory. <laughs> well, Data is this computer. Uh, on the um, new Star, Star Trek series, and he uh, walks like a duck, talks like a duck, <laughs> looks like a duck. In other words, he talks like a man, walks like a man, looks like a man. He's a person mm -hmm. until they take the hairpiece off, and his brain is all computer chips. And he I gets see. plugged into the Enterprise computer and says things like processing, processing. You know, he's a computer, but he's a person. So it's a case of a machine being a person. So we really got in our culture, even in the media, this idea that the body in some ways is dispensable. Well, it's a thing or a machine. Mm -hmm. And persons are machines and machines are persons. The whole, um, I know I'm dating myself here, but there was a show on TV called The Six Million Dollar Man where they, they replaced all of his physical parts with machinery. Right. And he was better because he was stronger and more powerful. He could run faster and so mm -hmm. forth. So the, we are just a collection of machine parts. And whether it's flesh and blood or whether it's computer chips, it really doesn't make any difference because we are really machines or this things. It really goes against what John Paul II oh, sure. is right. telling us. There's the whole, the whole area of sports casting. You know, people say on... Um, any kind of sport casting announcers will use machine-like terms. He's got an arm like a rifle. He's got great wheels. He's got all the tools. Like there's a hardware store mm -hmm. running down the mm -hmm. uh, running down the field. Well, we'll talk some more in a minute about some of this imagery that we're using in our culture with regard to the human body. the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Next time you visit EWTN.com, be sure to check out the Religious Catalog section. You'll find a wide variety of Catholic products. From Bibles to rosaries, there's something for everyone and you can order online. It's easy, safe, and secure. Shop the Religious Catalog 24 hours a day at EWTN.com. We now return to Theology of the Body on EWTN Radio. Welcome back. We're talking about John Paul II's Theology of the Body in this third show in the series. And we were saying before the break that uh, much of our society regards the human body as a little bit less than the way John Paul II does. He talks about the human body as the expression of the person, speaking the language of personhood and even the language of God, yeah. being sacred and holy. Our culture uh, has a 
slightly different view anyway, at least if you look at the what you might call the pop culture, and it's that the body's a thing or a machine. Movies certainly reflect that, as do some of the sports announcers who use machine-like imagery to explain and describe the abilities of these great athletes. Right, and know. yet what John Paul II wants us to understand is what is done to the body is done to, to the, the person. person. It's really not not sinful or wrong, it's not an error, there's nothing wrong with thinking about the body as a machine or thing. As long as everybody knows it's just a, a entertainment or mm -hmm. it's just a joke. I mean, people talk about their medical problems this way sometimes, you know. The old ticker isn't working so well, I need to go in and get the plumbing fixed, we got to put some new spark plugs in, um, unleaded and leaded uh, coffee and so forth and so on. These are all machine-like images, but so what? It's a way of distancing yourself from these medical procedures, which sometimes are unpleasant. But sometimes language can reveal the way we think actually, and actually think at a more subconscious level. Right. And so where does John Paul II want to take us? Well, you see, what he's doing, I think, and this is my view of it, is that he's holding up two worlds. He's holding up this world where the body is sacred and holy, speaking the language of personhood and even the language of God, mm -hmm. that it reveals God, as you said. Or you can have this other idea where it's just a machine or thing, a few things that, you know, parts that we carry around with us. So hospitals are really not hospitals, they're repair shops or body shops, human body part shops, where you go buy a leg or buy an arm or whatever you might need. Um, and you get programmed and, you know, the computers uh, are put into you so that you, the, the computers can read what's wrong with you or what's going wrong, just like a, a car. Now, again, this is only really a problem when you start thinking about it and believing it. And believe me, as you all know, there are people who believe it because the whole line of the extreme abortionist, this is my body, is really just and our claim of ownership over the body, don't you think? Yes, I do. And also, as you were talking, I was thinking about embryonic stem cell research. Oh, sure. Yeah. And the whole test tube baby. Mm -hmm. It really does treat the human person like a product. Like you know, a thing. Like mm -hmm. a thing. Something that we can create, or as long as we can, if science can do it, then it must be acceptable, as opposed to really seeing that there's a dignity in the human body and a dignity in how that life is supposed to come into being already in relationship. Right, you know, right. in in the um, test tube, there there's not a relationship going on there. But the way God designed for the human person to come into being is in relationship, there because is, that yeah. image is Him. Right. He's in relationship right. in the Trinity. Exactly. So that the, and if it's just a thing, if the body is just a thing, then we're just things. And if we're just things, and things get used, you use things, and you're supposed to love people. If you get this thing. This, this reverse, where you uh, love things and use people, you, you're, there are going to be real problems. So I just want to say that again, that what we've been doing is reversing that. So we love things like I love my dog, dog yeah. and then we use people. We use Whereas people. for John Paul II, a person is never an object to be used, but a person to be loved. loved. Even in the body, and the body mm -hmm. isn't a thing or a machine. And much of the sexual revolution of the 1960s is based on this concept that the body is just a thing, a machine. Now, we have to draw this out a little bit because some things people might like. They might want to contracept or sterilize. Uh, but if the body is a thing or a machine, then there's a whole range of activities one buys that you could never, ever argue against. You mentioned a couple of them, test tube babies. Uh, you also buy abortion. You buy embryonic stem research, as you were talking about, killing these little little tiny children. You buy freezing them. I can't imagine freezing a person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how anybody could do that, but it's going on. But you also buy things as bad as slavery, because if the body is a thing, it can be bought and sold. Right. It can be used it really be used however I deem that right. benefits me. Right. It's if just it, a toy. Right. right. If it benefits me, then then it should then it's fine. Right. And you even buy child abuse because the parents produced it. In fact, the extreme pro-abortionists call the child a product, a thing. Two machines, mom and dad, factories, if you will, came together to produce this third product. If Ford Motor Company doesn't like a truck they produce, they can tear it apart, put the parts back on the assembly line, start over again. That would be abuse of the truck if the truck were a person. Mm -hmm. If all the child is is a product, a thing, 
a machine. Now, I'm talking about the body, of course, not inside they would say, well, there's a person inside maybe, but it's got no relationship to the body. If the parents decide to abuse the child, could you argue against it? Not if the body's a thing or a machine. So what we've done is really separated the body from the person, person. Mm -hmm. and said that we can treat the body in any, any way, you know, X, Y, Z, these ways, um, and that's separate from treating the person. person. And what you're saying is, no, you can never, ever separate the person from the body because, I think as John Paul II says, we are body persons. We're right? body persons, We are right? spirits embodied yeah. in a body. Yeah. And so we have always got to maintain that unity between body and spirit, body and person. If you do not, then civilization just simply ends. Because the only, the only reason why we have civilization, civilization, citizenship, it's really, civil goes back to uh, sort of a city-state arrangement, is for persons. Uh, I mean, dogs don't build cities. Dogs don't govern themselves. But it's to protect and encourage Courage. and nurture persons into their full potential, exactly. into everything that they right. can be. Right. Government is instituted for the welfare of the individuals, of the people. Mm -hmm. Good law enhances and protects human dignity. Bad law harms and denigrates it. If the body has no has no value, then there's no reason f to protect it, and, and there's no reason to have a government. And in the Ten Commandments, were some of them oriented exactly towards protecting the, the person, protecting our relationships with each other so we would not use each other. Exactly right. The, the, the second table, so to speak, from the fourth to the tenth commandment. And it's interesting, when, when Christ was asked by the rich young man, which commandments, the first one he quotes, the first one, it's not honor your father and your mother, and it's not don't commit adultery. It's the fifth one, thou shalt not kill. That's the first that he quotes. And that obviously relates directly to the body. Mm. Because you can't kill the soul. Even in hell, the soul is still alive. But you can kill the body. And that's the one that Christ points to as the foundation stone for the commandments. So ever since, really, Genesis, and in, in cult all cultures everywhere, even prior to Genesis, there was this sense that there was a difference between human persons and all other persons, and a difference between all creatures on earth and human persons. And obviously the body was part of that, the human body. But we've lost some of that, we've obviously, lost some today. Of that. Right. And the revolution that we've experienced and, and the continuing um, ongoing ramifications of the sexual revolution of the 60s really has kind of run its course, I think, because you can't go much further than euthanasia and legalized suicide, uh, experimenting on embryos. I mean, that, that's getting pretty uh, extreme. Right. And if you push it any further, there isn't going to be anything left to, to human dignity or civilization. And now John Paul II is going to take us back to our orange, isn't he, to our, our six different sections or cycles. cycles. And the first one he's going to look at, at this body before sin, because really what you're describing are the consequences of sin, that that's why we degrade the body and that's why we abuse it and treat it as an object. Correct? Well, we want to do these things and the only way to justify them is to say the body is a plaything mm -hmm. and therefore I can play with it any way I want. Right, but Adam and Eve's experience of the body was certainly not that. Before original sin, no, it sure wasn't. No. That's true. And John Paul II, as you, as you well know, points that out. Right, right. And so in the first cycle, he's going to take us uh, back to the beginning, isn't he? Right, mm -hmm. exactly. He uh, starts out the theology of the body with a uh, reference to Christ. One day the Pharisees came up to the Lord, you remember? Mm -hmm. And the Pharisees asked him, uh, asked Christ, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? And of course, Christ always did this. He said, well, let's look at the text, which is good Jewish rabbinical um, teaching pedagogy. That's what they always did. And the text he quotes was the first, uh, the first words of Genesis. In the beginning, it was not so. And Christ goes on to say that it was because of your hardness of heart, in other words, sin, that Moses gave you this decree of divorce. But everyone who heard Christ knew that he was quoting the first words of the Bible in the beginning, the first words of Genesis. And so the, John Paul II sees in this answer of the Lord to the Pharisees a reference to Genesis and therefore a justification for doing an extensive analysis of the Garden of Eden 
before sin. He, I think one of the most remarkable things about theology of the body and most of the cycles is that John Paul II begins with the words of Christ. Always. You know, yeah. he's not just spouting yeah. his own theology, his own thoughts. He begins with the words of Christ, and then based on those words, he gives a very deep reflection. And this is a great example. I think what, it's in Matthew 19. Right. Um, 3 yeah. to 9 is this encounter with the Pharisees, and it's about divorce. It's about, yeah. And he uses that to then, as a launching pad with, in the beginning it was not so, to launch back to um, the very first cycle of in the beginning with Adam and Eve before original sin and that's where he's really going to start his reflections and theology of the body. And that lays the foundation some of these ideas that we were just talking about with the body is the expression of the person what personhood is how we have a mind and a will and so on and he talks then about mostly the second chapter of Genesis because the first chapter is the six day account the, s the second and third chapters are the case where Adam is created alone and then Eve. And the first chapter, he says, is from an objective point of view, God's point of view, the way God saw it, so to speak. The six days is probably, probably a literary device to organize the material. The second chapter are the experiences of Adam and Eve recorded as they experience them which to a phenomenologist is fascinating because this is the data that a pheno phenomenologist would have extracted by laborious questioning of people who had gone through those experiences. But the second and third chapters, it's all laid out, and then he proceeds to analyze it. Well, thank you for joining us uh, on this third show on the Theology of the Body. Uh, we'll see you again for the fourth and the rest of the shows in the series. Bye for now. You've been listening to Theology of the Body with Father Richard Hogan and Katrina Zeno on the EWTN Global Catholic Radio Network.